Welcome to another episode of Real People, Real Stories, where we provide you with compelling tales from everyday people just like you. I'm your host, John Wendell Adams, author of the novels Betrayal and Payback, along with the soon-to-be-released novel, Ruthless. You can always find me by going to john at johnwendelladams.com. So for the next 23 minutes, let's get to today's guest. To not have this happen to anyone else's child, to not have another family torn apart in such a horrific way. Vivian, how are you? I'm doing well. Thank you. Great, great. great. Thank you for agreeing to be a part of this episode of Real People, Real Stories. I'm excited about you being uh, here and telling this compelling story. And so um, I want to ask you two questions before we get started. Well, actually three. So the first one is just tell our audience uh, who you are, where you live, and what you do. Well, first, thank you so much for having me. Um, I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, So my name is Vivian McHenry. I live in Northern California uh, in a county called Contra Costa County. I am with an organization called uh, the Miles Hall Foundation. We were formed uh, last year by a group that I was uh, one of the original founders of called the Friends of Scott, Alexis, and Ton Hall, otherwise known as FOSATH. That's the acronym. But uh, the Miles Hall Foundation is how we're mostly known now. When we talked before, there were two terms. One I was a little more familiar with than the other, but if you could, on the front end of this whole thing, if you could just tell us what a 5150 is, because frankly, before we talked, I had never heard of that before. And then the second one is just about schizoaffective. That will, I think, play into uh, the compelling story you have to tell about uh, Miles Hall. Sure, those are great questions. Uh, So a 5150 is the uh, Welfare and Institutions Code in um, California for an involuntary hold when one is experiencing a psychiatric crisis or mental health crisis. If someone, you know, voluntarily goes into the hospital or goes to get help, help, then of course a 5150 is not necessary, but often people don't know that they have a mental illness. They don't know that they're sick and, or maybe they're off their meds, something like Mm -hmm. that, and they refuse to go. And so the only way to get an adult who, you know, who has the right to say no, the only one to get an adult um, psychiatric help um, involuntarily is to get them uh, 5150. And that often involves the police. I see. And then if you could just spend a minute just talking about um, schizoaffective. So schizoaffective disorder is, uh, it's a mental illness. It's a disability. We really encourage people to think about mental illness in the same way you would any other disability. If one were blind, if one were deaf, you know, it's a medical condition. Schizoaffective disorder is a combination of uh, schizophrenia and other mood disorders, like maybe bipolar disorder or severe depression, things like that. Um, It it often requires um, a combination of meds, medications and uh, counseling to treat, but it is definitely treatable. That really touches my heart because our daughter is, um, she was diagnosed as uh, schizoaffective. So I have some familiarity associated with that, but uh, maybe some of the, uh, our audience isn't. So thank you for that explanation. And the one about Mm -hmm. 5150, because I found that it was only in uh, the state of California. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah. So with that uh, being said, Spend some time telling us about what really happened to Miles Hall in on June 2nd of 2019. A dear friend of mine is Ton Hall, actually, Ton and Scott Hall. They're Miles' uh, parents. It was a Sunday afternoon. Actually, their daughter and my older daughter and their daughter, Miles' sister, was at our home swimming and hanging out regular Sunday afternoon in the summer. And all of a sudden, she received a call from her dad, um, Scott asking her to uh, come to the hospital right away. Miles had a schizoaffective episode, what's known as an episode. Schizophrenia is often, the symptoms often come in waves, especially when one is off their meds. My friend Ton took a real, really proactive measures to make sure that everybody not only knew the family, knew that Miles had, you know, mental illness, 
um, but also worked with the police department. The police had assigned a CIT officer, that's another acronym, uh, that stands for crisis intervention training. They're supposed to have at least more specialized care in crisis intervention, especially um, as it relates to mental illness. So Ton had contacted the police the day before, um, letting them know, listen, hey, Miles is having an episode. We're starting to see these signs. Schizophrenia is often associated with um, hallucinations, delusions, confusion. So in Miles' case, when he had an episode, he thought that he was Jesus. He would have these hallucinations. He would often knock on doors um, of his neighbors, talking to them as if he was Jesus. When he wasn't in an episode, he liked to garden, and one of the neighbors had given him a pole to help with his grouch so that he and his grandmother could kind of dig vegetables. But when he was in his episode, he thought that pole was um, a gift from God. And so he would kind of carry it around like, you know, like Jesus with his rod and staff. And so it is important to note that based on what you've described, mm -hmm. Miles was not a violent, I mean, even when he had an episode, he was not a, a violent person. I mean, he just right. was very mild, even in terms of his thoughts and thinking about him being Jesus and carrying this, um, this pole with him. Yes, he was not. He had no history of violence. He um, was not some sort of, you know, hardened criminal or anyone to be um, concerned about. You know, the reality is, is that, you know, Miles is a, was a young black man. This city in, in Contra Costa County is called Walnut Creek. It is a very kind of exclusive, affluent, predominantly white community. And so this young black man coming to people's doors, knocking on the door unsolicited or, you know, roaming through the streets when he was in an episode was something that could be cause for concern for people who don't have experience with either A, mental illness or B, um, young black men <laughs> or sure. black people. Sure. And so um, the family really wanted to take a proactive uh, step to make sure that everyone knew that Miles belonged, that he was a, a member of the community. During this partic particular episode, this was the first time that Miles had exhibited more, not necessarily combative, but he was definitely behaving erratically. He had, mm -hmm. uh, at one point inside his home, he turned with the, it was a long metal pole. He ended up breaking a slider, a glass slider. Uh, door, one of those sliders that goes out to the backyard. So, you know, property damage. He, he wasn't threatening anybody. He wasn't trying to destroy things or hurt anyone, but he did break that glass with the pole. He was very much, you know, increasingly out of control, increasing, increasingly kind of manic, you know, that was cause for concern. And so the family did call um, for help. And what's really important to understand about a 5150, at least in California, you have to, in order to get help, you have to fall into three categories. You have to say it, even if you don't fall into those categories. You have to say that someone is either a danger to themselves, a danger to others, or gravely ill. And Miles never fell into either of those three very narrow categories in order for you know a family to get an mental health patient, an adult um, loved one, help. And so that right there is part of, you know, the problem, um, just systemically, you know, that, that there's so, it's so difficult to get an adult um, psychiatric patient help when they don't want it. There's ways you can get a conservatorship, conservatorship and so forth, but that takes a couple of years and the family was in the process of getting one. But if you don't have that, you have to rely often on the police. Um, right. And in this case, they called the police. They had done that before. They had been able to get a successful psychiatric hold for Miles before, 5150 before. They had no reason to believe that they were, you know, putting Miles in danger uh, when they made that call for help. But unfortunately, the dispatcher um, in the Walnut Creek Police Department sent uh, for what ended up being five officers to the scene who were unfamiliar with Miles. Um, two of them were novice officers, one, I think, one year on the force and the other four years on the force. But in a town like Walnut Creek, four years may as well be four minutes. Well, wait, so I understand. So we get the whole context of this. Mm -hmm. Something that would happen as a protection for Miles, mm -hmm. calling the police department, to invoke this 5150 mm -hmm. turned into five police officers showing up. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. That's correct. And so 
would a social worker be a part of this uh, 5150 phenomenon? No, not always. That's in, it's becoming increasingly, I don't want to say popular is not the word, but increasingly recognized as a necessity. But yes. as a rule, um, no, some 60 years ago, there were all kinds of hospitals or, and homes for people who had mental illness and they could you could get all kinds of treatment. And now sure. uh, people who experience mental illness depending on how severe it is and what their resources are and who they have taking care of them or if they'll allow themselves to be taken care of. It's just a, it's a cycle in and out of, you know, either the prison system or, sure. you know, the temporary holds and then you're released mm-hmm. and then you're back with family and then you go through it all over again. You know, in this case, the, the fifth person, the fifth officer to arrive was that one CIT officer that the family had built a relationship with. But she was several minutes out. The ones who arrived first were the four that were unfamiliar. And even though they knew, the dispatcher had told them that, you know, the family called and other neighbors had called as well. So they knew that that this was someone who was um, experiencing mental illness. But because he had broken the window and, and because he was behaving erratically and, and aggressively and because police, let's face it, you know, they have they received 60 hours of training to use their guns and their weapons. And at best, you know, eight hours for crisis intervention um, training, you know, to learn how to interface with uh, mental illness. Police are not mental health workers, right? And I don't want to make a sweeping indictment for, you know, all people in law enforcement. But I would say that, you know, in general, the police culture is uh, one to fight crimes and to gain compliance right away. There, it's not to be patient and to, you know, necessarily lead with compassion. Mm-hmm. Um, and especially in our country. Our police officers are so heavily militarized in terms of their gear, you know, head to toe, even to someone who's not in crisis, someone who's showing up in a big, you know, what I call sometimes Power Rangers outfit with, you know, the ballistic shield and the the vest and the, you know, they already have their guns drawn, even if it's less, you know, less lethal uh, weapons to shoot, you know, rubber bullets or what have you. It still looks like a gun. And well, that scares me. So it especially yeah. scares someone who's in a mental health crisis. Let's put this in perspective. Mm-hmm. So the family, maybe a neighbor or two, calls. Mm-hmm. The dispatcher sends out uh, individuals, one of which is someone who was familiar with uh, with uh, Miles, but showed up later than the other four policemen. Right. They're well, in their gear. Tell us where is Miles and tell us what then happened? What transpired? So Miles was walking through the neighborhood with his rod and staff. He was talking to people. He was, he thought he was Jesus. He was, he, he was in his episode, he was uh, at demanding grapes from people. He was saying all kinds of things that weren't, that, you know, had no semblance of reality. And, and it was clear that he was hallucinating, but he was walking through the neighborhood. But the police wanted to, you know, get hold of him. And the way that they chose to do that, rather than follow their training, their de-escalation training, which really calls for them to create space and distance and talk in a calm voice. I mean, the last thing you're supposed to do and the last thing even that their training tells them to do when you interface with someone in a, in a especially in a, a severe mental illness like that is start screaming at them, right? It, it, it makes someone often more uh, fearful and confused. And so they started screaming various things at him, had their, you know, had their weapons drawn, um, shot within seconds, shot rubber bullets at him, which terrorized him even more. He um, was always very protective of that of that gift that had come from a neighbor that he thought was a gift from God. He, you know, held on to it and went running to try to get around them, and as and and towards his home because they had blocked off when they surrounded him. They blocked off the one area, the one it was a cul-de-sac and it was kind of the one path that would go to his childhood home where he had lived since he was four. Mind you, he's, he's 23 at this point. Right. So it was second nature to run home when he was fearful. Sure. Even after he was hit with, you know, with rubber bullets, he proceeded to try to zigzag around these officers and run home. And the, the one year, actually the one year and the four year, the officers who were one and four years on the force respectively, drew their guns and, and shot him four times and, and killed him within mm-hmm. seconds uh, after he was already shot. That fifth uh, officer who was this crisis intervention training officer uh, arrived on the scene. By that time, it was, you know, it was too late. He was, he was taken to the, off, uh, to the hospital and he died later that day. Boy, I am so sorry. So yeah. sorry. 
and um, there, I can only imagine what their his mom and dad must have felt as a result yeah. of that. Yes, it's it's something that um, you know, even to this day, when I think about it, I get emotional about it. It's you know, as I think as a parent, but as especially as a, a mother, you can't. It's really hard to. Um, it's hard to describe, you know, and this is, you know, Ton's firstborn child. She was one of the people who called for help. So there's a, a huge weight, you know, on your heart when you know that you are the one that called for help and that ended up um, becoming a, a, a death sentence for your child. You know, there's a, a double sense of loss, right? Because when your child experiences mental illness and sometimes they're not themselves, they're a different version of the person that you've always known, you right. you know, there's a sense of grief there too because you your, your child is sick, you know? And then when you lose them when and to violence, to gun violence, and police violence is gun violence, Right. Um, in such a tragic, horrific way. It's, um, you know, it's, I would go and speak with Ton and, and, and honestly, there were most of the time for probably a year, I wouldn't even be able to look, look at her. I would always look away as I was talking to the mm -hmm. audience or whatever we were doing, because if I looked at her, I would just yeah. become completely overwhelmed. And sure. so, um, I'm in awe of her strength because the rest of us around her are just, uh, we can barely hold it together sometimes, but right. she has such, um, she is, has such grace and courage. Um, and she wants justice for her child, but her, but her, and, and we fight tirelessly for that, but her number one priority is um, to not have this happen to anyone else's child, to right. not have this happen, to not have another family torn apart um right. with in such a horrific way well thank you for that uh vivian that's a very compelling story and i guess what i want to do is i want to move to really um what has happened as a result of this unfortunate situation with uh with miles we immediately in the days after miles was killed we organized we didn't know what to do I, you know we weren't like professional activists or organizers or anything like that. We didn't know what to do. We just started making calls to other organizations who, um, you know, one of the first ones was the uh, was Love Not Blood, which is uh, run by the uncle of Oscar Grant. You may be familiar with that name. He was, the whole movie called Fruitvale was made after um, the story of Oscar Grant, who was killed by police at the BART station um, in a, uh, 2012, I believe it was. Um, so we started organizing immediately um, and building a coalition of allies that could help advise us, that could support us, um, that could speak with us when we would rally or protest. We, we attended every single city council meeting um, to try to get the ear of city leaders and the chief of police and the city manager and so forth. Um, because it was so clear, well, number one, we wanted an independent and transparent um, investigation. We wanted some accountability, officers right. off the street. Um, and it was so clear that systemically something was so wrong that you, that a family would not be able to call anybody but the police. And to get the police, you have to say, well, you know, someone's um, a danger to themselves or others. And then, you know, the police and unfortunately, sometimes don't use their discernment. They just, they come in ready to, you know, like they're trying to catch a bank robber or something, everybody. With it's, guns and, blazing. Absolutely. And there's a, a saying that's, and I can't remember who coined the phrase, but I often, um, I often quote it. It's, you know, because police, they, they, they resort to their guns for, you know, almost everything and see everything kind of as a, as a, crime or crime in the process or getting ready to happen. And I often say, you know, when you, when all you have is a, is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And, um, and that's what, you know, that's what happened that day. And that's, there's systemic issues all up and down with the mental health, you know, s system with the criminal justice system. Uh, and so that has been our, our biggest goal is to um, raise awareness, to educate people, um, and to uh, organize so that we've got, you know, folks that are working on um, legislative changes 
and systemic changes uh, locally at, at right. the city level and county level. Right. Well, one of the things that I found really compelling was the fact that uh, you saw, you started uh, FOSATH with uh, a half dozen individuals, and it's yeah. grown dramatically. Talk about that. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. No, there were um, one of Ton's other, uh, you know, lifelong college friends, uh, uh, lifelong, <laughs> I'm telling my age now, but since college, she had uh, was the first uh, founder, her name is Shyama Clooney, and she gathered up, uh, you know, four or five others of us that uh, were close to Ton and, and the halls. And so there were six of us initially that worked tirelessly um, to really, you know, build kind of an infrastructure and, and as I said, a coalition of allies um, for this organization and built it up from, you know, half a dozen of us to, uh, I think there's like 535 people um, now. And the coalition of allies includes, you know, some some national allies. I mean, we've got the ACLU, we've got uh, Together We Will, we've got um, Moms Demand Action, which is a national um, gun safety, um, uh, I don't want to say gun control, gun safety um, organization. Um, and the list just goes on and on. NAMI, of course, um, NAMI became the closest and 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 most um, you know critical ally, uh, especially NAMI Contra Costa, which is uh, you know here where we are in Northern California. What I want to do is I want to give you an opportunity to really speak to our audience who, you know, many of them don't live in California mm -hmm. about things that they can do either as it relates to FOSAF or as it relates to their own communities to help that this kind of thing wouldn't transpire. So that's one thing I want to ask you. And then the second one, I just want you to speak to sort of the broader uh, police, state, local, federal agencies, if you had an opportunity to uh, communicate sort of your thoughts and feelings uh, coming out of this thing that happened to uh, Miles Hall, what would you say? Yeah, yeah, no, thank you. Those are good questions. Again, um, you know, I think regardless of where you are in the country, um, we always ask, ask people to join us. Um, to, because we um, now are working on uh, a bill that was recently proposed by our uh, one of our local assemblywomen, um, Rebecca Bauer Cahan, and that bill is um, Assembly Bill 988 uh, that we are hoping will be named. She's proposed it as such that it will be named the Miles Hall Lifeline Act. Mm -hmm. And um, there's other legislation that we're interested in pursuing and lifting up. Um, and uh, and then also a, uh, what's another initiative that's very important to us is to create a 24/7 non-police, you know, non-violent mental health crisis um, mobile crisis uh, program. And it would be a, a pilot program locally, but we're hoping that that will, you know, um, go beyond our county and into the state and then be picked up in other states. So the first thing I would say is go to Justice for Miles Hall. Dot org and go to the section use the drop down window that uh, and there's the section called get involved and there are all kinds of ways there whether it's letter writing campaigns whether it's um you know joining city council meetings they're all via zoom these days right sure, sure. um it, whether it's joining the um the meetings when we speak up for the board of supervisors you know uh, what we end up doing locally here will impact, will be a model, we hope, for what is going to happen across the state and across the country. Sure. Um, and there's other ways to get involved as well. So we really ask um, that people support the Miles Hall Foundation and get involved in, in any way that they can. If, they're, um, if there's something going on locally, and unfortunately, uh, you know, these, these systemic issues with um, with our behavioral health systems and um, treatment, our healthcare system, and with police violence, you know, is something that in, uh, occurs across the country. And so, the first thing I would tell people is to um, never miss an opportunity to vote. Um, it is so important, um, not just the presidential votes and not just the top of the ticket, but all the way down to make sure that you are getting behind candidates who are uh, who support, um, you know, common sense gun safety, who support police reform, um, who support, you know, building equitable communities, um, not just communities that are going to support, you know, able bodied um, 
you know, wealthy people uh, or certain, you know, narrow demographics, but, but, but candidates who are going to support the most vulnerable in our society, because sure. when we support the most vulnerable in society, everybody wins. Hmm. Um, and when we don't, and when we just let them, you know, because AB 988 isn't just for mental health crises calls like this one. It's also for suicide prevention. It's also for homelessness calls. These are calls that by and large, you know, you can speak to pretty much any police officer. I've spoken to many, many, many over the over the um, years since this happened to Miles. And they will all say, regardless of their you know, politics or their position or their what have you, they will all say that they do not prefer to be the first responders for mental health calls and for homelessness calls. Oh. Um, it's just not, it's not their wheelhouse, you know? Sure. Um, and so it, it, it really behooves them, it, you know, the, the law enforcement community as well to really get behind um, this bill and bills like it that are cropping up across the country um, because it would, you know, allow police to, um, Fight crime <laughs> and respond sure. to crim crime, you know, criminal uh, calls or criminality, and allow social workers or mental health workers or just people who have a heart for that type of work, um, who are trained in de-escalation, you know, those would be the people that would respond, um, whether it's on a 24/7 um, crisis, you know, hotline, or if right. there's a mobile uh, mobile response unit that needs to be dispatched to the scene, but they would not be people, and they would arrive in plain clothes, sure. they would be unassuming, they would, you know, un understand how to de-escalate and speak calmly to someone who's in the middle of a, of a schizoaffective episode in this case. Um, oh. So, you know, I would say that to get involved, um, join organizations that are, you know, that are aligned with those goals of protecting the most vulnerable in society. And then to your second point, if I were to speak to anyone in law enforcement, it would be kind of just what I alluded to a minute ago. We have, I don't think that they often realize that people in law enforcement realize that there's, they have so much in common with civilians. It's not an us versus them. We're, you're not at war with civilians. You don't, you know, to leaders, I would say there's, you don't need to arrive into communities in militarized, you know, gear with um, militarized, um, you know, armored rescue vehicles, if there's some sort of rally or protest or something, you know, um, people are looking for, for um, justice, they're looking for transparency and accountability, they're looking for compassion and kindness and empathy. Right. Um, and I think we all have those, you know, those, those same goals in terms of who responds to um, non criminal, non violent um, crises calls, right? they would rather not be the, the first responders to those calls. So great, don't right. be. And we'll right. establish a 9889, a 988 number instead of a 911 number that would be called for these types of calls so that they it gets, you know, the proper people with the proper skill set get dispatched to the scene. People right. don't get shot and killed. Lives are saved. Mm -hmm. Families and, and communities are not um, left in, in tatters. Well, Vivian, I have to say, you know, when I, I listened to you and the time we talked, one of the things that was really compelling, and we just have a, a few minutes here, but one of the things that was really compelling is how much it is that you and the folks that represent FOSAF have done in less than two years. I mean, you've amassed interest and heart share mm -hmm. and mind share in a relatively short period of time yeah. gone mm -hmm. from a county to california and really uh, as you talked about nami even from a national perspective and the things that you're talking about are really essential not just for walnut creek or the county that you happen to live in but for all of america and maybe the world in that regard but uh, i just want to thank you for being so open and transparent and really just communicating to us the essence of not only the Miles Hall story, but also the aftermath and the things that uh, you and, and the folks a uh, part of uh, FOSATH are, are doing. And uh, thank you for that. Thank you for coming and joining us. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. And um, again, continue to encourage your viewers to, to go to Justice for Miles Hall dot org and get involved.
Well, and I'll say this to you, that as time goes on, mm -hmm. I imagine that there will be a great many more things that you'll end up uh, doing that we'd uh, like to have you come back and, and share with us some additional uh, adventures and episodes associated with what's going on with full staff full staff as it relates to Miles Hall. So thank you so much for joining us. Absolutely. Thank you. My pleasure. Well, listen, uh, folks, you just experienced another episode of Real People, Real Stories. And so we look forward to seeing you next time. You can always find me by going to john at johnwendelladams.com.